All right, welcome to another episode of The Catholic Couple, having fun with faith, family, and friends. I'm your co-host, Bobby Fredrickson. With me, as always, my beautiful wife. Katie Fredrickson. I'm the convert Catholic, and she's the... The cradle Catholic. And dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. We have kind of a heavy episode. Heavy episode on suffering and evil. <laughs> yeah. No, nothing, nothing down about you that. You know, happy Thanksgivings. <laughs> yeah, we're in the post-Thanksgiving uh, time off. Yeah, right. Like, Ending that Thanksgiving break, I guess, right? And, you know, um, full disclaimer, uh, Bob hurt his back. He hurt his back a few years ago and had to have surgery, and he was in a tremendous amount of pain and has spoken about, you know, how that affected him and actually strengthened his faith. And now we're back kind of into the same situation with severe a severe injury again in your back, Um uh, so I, you know, thought, hey, why don't we do a podcast episode about why do bad things happen to people? You know, so you could speak right from your pain. Very, very timely, yes. <laughs> well, so mean, we, th- we th- th- those are things that people r- uh, wrestle with, these ideas. Right, right. And you're going to, you're in the mix of wrestling with it right now. So if he sounds a little, you know, weird... Uh, he's in a lot of lot of pain, and um, Sorry. this might not be a full, like really long one of those long episodes. I don't know how long we'll be able to have you sitting and everything, but we thought it would be beneficial to kind of talk this out, and then also unpack what the catechism actually has to say about what what does the church actually teach on this. So it's it's catechism paragraphs three hundred nine through three. 11, um, really 314 all the way through. But <clears throat> I think that it's important to note that because when I was reading this to, to, when I was reading these to you, you said right off the, the rip, like, no, no, that's evil. That's about evil. And as we unpack this, it's important to um, understand that evil, what's the etymology of evil? Like, what's the breakdown of the word? That's how I know you're not right, because don't you know this stuff by heart? Um. <laughs> I know evil as the absence of good, right? Evil is an absence of something. It, it is a thing. It is an entity. It is a real presence, but, it, but it's an absence of good. So we're talking about moral evil or like the devil or, you know, things like that. That's an, an absence of, of God's goodness, Hell is an absence of God's... It's an, it's an absence of something. Okay? So, the actual... Mm, yeah, it just says bad. Well, that's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. the absence of something. That's how I've learned it, that evil is an absence of good. Is that how you've learned it as well in things you've studied? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it manifests itself in something offensive, too, at the same time. But it's, yeah, it's because there's a lack. Mm -hmm. That's where the space became available. Yeah, I mean, suffering and evil is, no one wants to talk about it. But, Mm -hmm. you know, the more we don't talk about it, especially if suffering, if you're going through it, or you know someone who is, is that, yeah, a lot of times it's, don't want to talk about it, because it's, you're just you're thinking about it all the time anyway, so it's like you don't want to keep talking about it. Um, so I'm going to read some excerpts from the Catechism to unpack this. So if we let's use that, that's our working definition of evil is an absence of good. Can we can we agree on that definition sure. together when we're looking at unpacking the Catechism that the evil is a, a an absence of the good. So. Physical evil is also mentioned in the catechism, and we need to look at that as the absence of the goodness of God's creation, including our bodies. So an absence of a good in your body is what? Or what would be the opposite of something good happening to your body? What's good? What's good in your body? What would be good? If you were like, my body's good, I'm what? Healthy. I'm healthy, right? So if your body's not working good or well, it's not healthy. 
It's not healthy. <laughs> Ooh, you are you're sharp right now. <laughs> so in that, I'm trying my best. That's an ev- that's an evil as in a loss of a good within your body. Does that make sense? Yes. That's how I'm interpreting this catechism, and I think that in what other things I researched, sounds like that is that same. Like I even looked up like. Why, what does the church say about like natural disasters? And it's that same thing, that, that, that lack. Because if you look back at Genesis, when the fall happened, you know, God's not cursing Adam and Eve per se. It's more like he's like, ah, now this is going to happen to you. Sorry. <laughs> you cut off the goodness from me, my and my creation, and now you've, you've allowed this absence of my good to enter the world, right? You've allowed this, this, um, this knowledge of good and evil, so good and the lack of good, right? And so he says, um, you know, curse be the, to to to, to um, Adam. Curse be the ground because of you. In toil shall you eat its yield all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you as you eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face shall you get bread to eat, until you return to the ground from which you were taken. For you are dirt, and, and to dirt you shall return. And, he, and, you know, he talks about, yeah, this is the, that the creation, the goodness of creation is still going to be there, but not everything's going to be working with you. Things are going to be working against you as well. That makes sense. And even to, to Eve, I'll intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children, yet your urge shall be for your husband, and he shall be your master. So it's talking about that imbalance now between natural things and the, and the goodness of, of, of nature, and that there's this, there's this going to be this opposite. And what's the heart of it ultimately is selfishness. I mean, the heart of most of the sinfulness or any of these this absence of good is that we're not focused on good, which is God. We're focused on only ourselves and what we can get. And that's the heart of every sin. It's like, what's in it for me? Like, no, I don't want to do God's way. I want to do my way. I don't care if it's someone else's. I'm going to take it for me. I'm going to lust after this person. I'm going to, f- I'm going to do, it's all these things. It's th- selfish desires, really. I think suffering can be generated from three different sources. One is the problems you create for yourself. True. Right? You get yourself into a bunch of problems that you can't feel sorry for yourself. You got yourself there and you're you're reaping the consequences of your own actions. It can be suffering can be generated from the suf- from the consequences of someone else's actions in your life, right? You're getting a ripple effect of some kind of harm someone else caused in the world. But there's that third, that third that nobody like a natural disaster or a loss of a child that's an act like a act like a a natural loss, you know, of of a child. Not not some drunk driver hitting your child or someone be, you know doing something stupid and does an accident. I'm talking about an actual like you have really nothing to blame. You did everything right. Yeah. You know, those are the things I think that people grapple with because you can, you can say, like, what's the big, the big answer here, which I'll read in the catechism, but the big answer is free will. Free will is the reason why evil exists or why they're still bad in the world and God doesn't act on it. But you can't always say free will for something that is completely out of your control, out of anyone else's control, and literally only in God's control. That's where I think people really lose when really bad things happen to people that are nobody's real fault, that you really have only by God to blame, right? And I think that we can talk, speak to that in your back pain. Yes, it's a consequence of your actions, but that was something that you did at, you know, while you were working and just lifted something the wrong way or, you know, but nobody did it to you and you were just doing what you were supposed to be doing. And we've prayed over you several times and there's no relief from this and it's daily. And have you found yourself, I'm going to go there, have you found yourself asking like, what did I do to deserve this? Or if God, if you really did love me, you would take this away from me. Uh. I wouldn't say I went that far. I just just don't understand. You know, when you go through this once to go through it again, it's it's just 
I already learned my lesson. I trusted you the last time. Yeah. <laughs> Did I, I not that's... trust you well enough that it's something that we have to prove ourselves to not get the thing that's bad happen to us? Like, oh, is it something I did to deserve this? I mean. Well, well let's just face <laughs> it. I, mean, I, I can always be humble, that's for sure. <laughs> so. You said it, not me. Um, so that, I mean, it's a reminder. We just take things for granted. It's You take your, your back for granted, your you're being able to walk upright, to to not be in pain, to to have running water, all these things we just naturally take for granted because we just have them. Mm-hmm. But it's when you that lack that you, when you don't have it is that when you really. You know, I mean, this listen, sounds listen. lame. I know it's funny. Have you when, when you've had like a stuffed up nose for like a month? You're like, oh, I just want to breathe, right again. You do. You take little dumb things like that for granted. I can't imagine, you know, being pain free, taking that for granted. Like that is that's. It's so hard when you're in the middle of it. You do start to think about what a regular average Tuesday was and how much grateful you would be for that if you just had that again. Yeah, and it's just, you know, we don't understand because we're not God, and there's reasons, obviously. F- you know, we're, we're called to believe that mm-hmm. everything happens for a reason, that it's part of free will, but also working through and with God and his plan, his purpose. Okay, I'm going to um, unpack, I'm going to read just little experts of, or, uh, excerpts of each of these paragraphs, sure. and let's just talk about them. Is that okay? Sure. It says, is, this is a par- Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 309. It says, if God the Father Almighty, the creator of the ordered and good world, cares for all his creatures, why does evil exist? To this question, as pressing as it is unavoidable and as painful as it is mysterious, no quick answer will suffice. And that's what we're kind of here to talk about this. We are not here to solve it. That, you know, I think that's something to say, like, I don't have all the answers. I'm not God. God has all the answers. But the church does have a very clear unpacking of this and and she says it herself that there is no quick answer well that, that's the one thing we can learn from from the bible is that the whole story of job you know it's a long book mm-hmm. and at the end really there's no and, and at answer. the end there, there is no, there is an answer it's not the answer that we want you know he went through all this his friends saying is it your parents' fault? Is it your fault? Mm-hmm. What did you do? What did do? you do? What did you get? Yeah. Well, all these things, these bad things that happened to Job. Well, mm-hmm. it must have been because of some way you were living your life mm-hmm. or or this or that. And it turns out, no, God made a deal with the devil that he can tempt you and take all your stuff because God believes that you're still going to have faith and, and you know believe and not you know curse God. Mm-hmm. And he didn't. So, but, but the end, the punchline was, were you there? When I created this world, were you there <laughs> no. when I made the rhinoceros? Were you there? No. So, you know, the, the whole thing is he doesn't give an answer why, but he just pr- presents himself. It's not for that. you to know why. I think that's but, what he's trying to but say. But he tells us that he's going to be there just with trust us. trust me. That he's mm-hmm. not an absentee God, that he's a God yeah. that, who, who became one of us. Entered into, into our suffering into and our, our suffering. pain and transformed and it into exactly something that was redemptive. And that's exactly it. So that he who's outside of space and time that did author all this goodness, that is goodness itself, can enter into our void. Because remember, what is evil is an absence of good. So he can enter into our voids and transform it. And that while these, these bad things do happen, he finds a way to transform it into something that is his permissive will, not his... Direct will. What is it not direct will? What's the word? Perfect will. Perfect will. Obviously, his perfect will would be a Eden. perfect, a perfect creation. A perfect creation like. with with like so it's uh, so okay, I'll 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 go on. It says only Christian faith as a whole constitutes constitutes the answer to this question. The goodness of creation, the drama of sin, and the patient love of God who comes to meet man by his covenants the redemptive incarnation of his son, his gift of the spirit, his gathering of the church, the power of the sacraments, and his call to a blessed life to which free creatures, free creatures are invited to consent. So 
and this is what I would explain to my students. If God didn't have, okay, so like we would talk about the tree, because I, I taught salvation history, and when we were talking about the tree in the garden, like it's not about the tree, and it's not about fruit, it's not about that, if that tree, because they were like, why did he put a tree in there? Anyway, I'm like, well, if you think about it, if there was no tree, that would be super creepy. <laughs> like, why, why is that creepy? I'm like, it's super creepy. Like, I'm going to make these people, and they're going to love me. And we're gonna, it's like, no, there needs to be a choice. Love is a choice. You, you can't love unless you have the choice to love. And again, if God is love, and if, you know, uh, God is good, then when there's an absence of God, or there's an absence of love, there's an absence of, of goodness, that's evil, right? So when we're, when we were unpacking that, it's like the tree had to exist there because love is a choice, because we are given freedom, we're respected in our freedom. And that if, it, if that wasn't there, we didn't have that choice and that opportunity and that opportunity to consent, then we're just creepy love slaves. Like we're just creepy like robots being kind of controlled by God, yeah. which isn't what love is, and it, it, it kind of just takes the whole thing out of it. Well, I heard a good quote from... Fulton Sheen that kind of goes with that was, was what's the difference between authoritarianism and authority? Authoritarianism always used physical force mm -hmm. to make you comply. God didn't want to be in a you know a dictator. Right. He was a lover. Mm -hmm. And there, an authority, which we get the word author of life, the authority mm -hmm. it comes from a relationship, from mutual respect. Right. That authority is that you know, you respect the person who's in charge, your mom and dad, or mm -hmm. because you don't want to disappoint them and that you love them. That's the difference between authority and, and there, it isn't physical. It, it could be in, in times, but it's not the, the, the way that it's intended to, to be enforced. Is there's you know, a relationship of give and take of protection and listening and following the rules because, you know, mm -hmm. with our kids, we know better than our kids. It's just the way yeah. it is. They think... You know, they should eat sugar and candy 24-7, and we obviously know better. So mm -hmm. our authority comes out of a love for them because we, we're mature and we're in charge. Mm -hmm. You know, not because we just want to tell them what to do, because God entrusted us with this great power to to be good stewards right. in, in everything, you know, the way that we raise them. So I think it's easier to understand the concept of evil when we look at it through that lens of love is a choice and that, you know, there needs to be a choice to be able to say no and saying no from God is turning away from him and turning away from him is turning away from goodness. And the more we walk away from goodness, the more there's an absence of that goodness and evil, you know, takes that over, take, you know, becomes that void. So while that's still very heavy and very difficult to understand and, and still something that you have to completely unpack, What's I think even more difficult is that idea of things that aren't a result of anyone's decisions whether it's yours or someone else's. And that's where the next paragraph in 310 says, but why did God not create a world so perfect that no evil could exist in it? With infinite power, God could always create something better. Like saying like, I think you've said this, like why do things decay? You know, why do things rot, right? Why does, I mean, honestly, why are there mosquitoes? Let's get real. Like, what is that? Why do we have to sleep? Why, yeah, you hate sleeping, so I love sleeping. So, like, why does our bodies, why do our, our bodies break down, right? Why does disease happen? Why does sickness happen? And so the catechism's answers to that <clears throat> is, but with infinite wisdom and goodness, God freely willed to create a world in a state of journeying towards its ultimate perfection. In God's plan, this process of becoming involves the appearance of certain beings and the disappearance of others, the existence of the more perfect alongside the less perfect, both constructive and destructive forces of nature. So let's look at like our human body can heal. Like if, if I got a cut in my hand, my hand is, will, will like my skin cells will, will come together and it'll, it'll, so that to me is a, a constructive force of nature, right? Something that builds back up. 
think about like how your muscles get, how, how when you work out, it hurts. But you know that through that pain and that endurance, that it produces endurance and that you, you know, you get stronger, lean, leaner muscles from that pain, right? You, uh, you might be out of breath in that one workout, but then going forward you have, you know, you, you know what I mean? So those are all constructive parts of nature, right, that better themselves through a, a, a use. But if you, ch- like, put a big um, gash in the side of a, of a tree, that stays there, right? There's certain things that can be destructed by certain forces. Does that make sense? Like, so that's what it's talking about, that the destructive and constructive forces of nature. With physical good, so physical goods are what we talked about earlier, your health, right? A physical good is your health. With physical good, there also exists a physical evil, as long as creation has not reached perfection. So again, it's hard to understand, like, why does bad things happen in the world? Why are there where are there things like even animals that attack, right, or, or hurt, any kind of causing pain or suffering within the world, you're either going to be doing it for a constructive purpose or that destructive purpose also, God can use that to a, to a, a greater good. But that destructive, the, that, you know, the destruction, it sucks and it causes suffering. Yeah. And there's nothing within that that is constructive sometimes. But in looking back, when you're on the other side of that suffering, is there anything good you could pull from the last time you hurt your back? Anything at all? Yeah, I mean, strength of my prayer life. I mean, when you're you're suffering and you're hurting, I mean, one of the only things that you really can do is try to get out of your, your pain or to get out of what you're thinking about and to to get out of yourself so you know praying a lot just reaching out to god you know to help and and it does you know even if it's just momentarily it helps but but i think just more of what i'm been feeling great for the last you know four years just being thankful because you only you have to have sometimes to have some things taken away to appreciate the thing that you have you don't miss it until it's gone. Mm-hmm. It's like you don't know what you got until it's gone. What's that song? Was that Mo- Motley Crue? <laughs> don't know what you Those got. Those hair bands, until yeah. It's gone. <laughs> no, that's gonna be in my head. Yeah, no. Well, because it's true. It's just like yeah. You know, if you're you're around somebody all the time, you, t- you can take them for granted. If they're, you know, if I always throw my laundry in the floor and Katie comes behind me and picks it up and puts it in the basket and doesn't say anything, then I just assume that it's just gonna do get I done. Do I do that? <laughs> oh, pretty good. I got a good shot. I got a good shot. I'm just wondering if I've ever done that without complaint. Go me if I did. I'm sure. Um, do you have any advice in a, in an extreme state of pain? As they say, offer it up, unite your suffering with Christ, and that's so easily said. You know, that's so easily, you know, these great saints that did it, right? But how is it in real time? Like when you're in an extreme amount of pain, how do, do you feel him with you? Do you, are there certain things you say or do that help to transform your pain? Or you just don't want to talk about it right now? Maybe maybe when you're out of the pain? <laughs> no, I, I just, for me, I... I like I like the Lord Jesus Christ. Have mercy on me, a sinner. So I'm just begging for mercy all day long, uh, selfishly in that way. But then I also unite the prayers. You know, I start my day the same. I still do the offering. I unite all the joys, the suffering of my work, all the prayers to unite those for for the conversion of sinners. For the right, I was going to say reparations, mm-hmm. the sins committed against the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of the Blessed Mother. So trying to unite for reparations, including for myself and my, my sins, my past sins, my future sins, and, you know, trying to unite those those things. But, you know, the, the thing with suffering is is that it can make you better or make you bitter. It's really easy to be bitter. Mm-hmm. Why me? Play the victim mm-hmm. and to do all that. And, and that's okay to go th- through that stage, you know. I gave myself about an hour 
<laughs> you uh, gave yourself an hour or you give yourself an hour a day? Uh, just the one time. Oh, wow. One, one time hour. Mm, to, better than me. Well, because it doesn't make any... It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't it make doesn't, it any better. No, that's for better. sure. It just makes it worse. It just... So just thinking about, okay, how can I eat healthy? How can I, you know, try to not let my whole body, like, deteriorate to, mm -hmm. you know, to not to be so stiff in certain angles and just trying to do my exercises and, and doing all the stuff as, as I'm waiting for, you know, MRIs and all this other stuff. But but I, I think it is cliche. It's offered up, offered mm -hmm. up. I mean, because people hear it because it's it sounds like it's... But it does work because when you take your prayers and you offer them up in union with Jesus on the cross, it helps not only you to realize how much it costs Jesus his life, mm -hmm. that we take that for granted and yeah. what, what that looks like. And by offering, you know, offering that up, mm -hmm. what that looks like, you know, I heard, a, because I've been looking for a refrain for the argument that, you know, that the, the argument that we don't have to do anything. You just have to say, Jesus Christ is Lord, and you're saved. And the Look at the gospel today. Exactly. It is not. What, I mean, he literally said, if you don't do this for the least of my my people, you haven't done it to me, and they'll be wailing and grinding of teeth or whatever. You know what I mean? And the last, yeah, the last those, weekend was wailing. There's a bunch of those spots, but one spot that they do turn to, say, well, look at the thief on the cross. Mm -hmm. all, he, all, he's he's going to be in He didn't have to do anything. He's on the cross. Look. Yeah, ex but he was on the cross suffering. Yeah. I that think that my, that, that might have been point. used. So I, I think the only exception. <laughs> so the exception is you have to do a thing unless you're being crucified on a cross next to Jesus. <laughs> right next to. <him. laughs> well, I hope that doesn't happen. But you know, others. but you know, they use yeah. that one like crazy mm -hmm. example, like the guy getting crucified next to Jesus. It's so funny, Braden. He, you know. Yeah, Braden to me during mass, after the gospel, uh, you know, was said, and we were sitting down. He goes, "Oh, so corporal works of mercy will get, will be what gets me into heaven." I was like, oh my gosh, who are you? But no, like, <laughs> we need to unpack that theologically. No, no, God, still, still his mercy. Still his grace. Still his grace. But you don't get his grace if you cut yourself off from it. You got to, And you anyway. can't bury your talents into the, right. that was the week before. Mm -hmm. just that, yeah, there are the, the We things. have to cooperate with this saving grace. We can't just sit back and receive it. We have to cooperate with it. And I think that's you know, a big thing with, with suffering and with, with trans, transformative and redemptive suffering is that it probably doesn't take away even one iota of the pain itself, but it does transform your mind into how you're processing the pain that you're going through when you offer up you know, uh, your pain for that day or what you're going through for that day for someone else or for something outside of you and knowing that it does have an effect. It's not, what is Ma Mother Teresa's uh, quote about suffering, like pointless suffering, that how much of it is just so much suffering is wasted. Yeah. I know. You, like the nursing homes and the hospitals. Yeah. Where... Don't let your suffering go to waste. You may be seeing it as an opportunity to make up for someone's lack somewhere in what they're going through, you know? Well, it's just, it's hard because it's, pain is something that needs to be attended to. Mm -hmm. It's hard to transcend it. Yeah. It's hard to, to work through it, to not it think is. that it's there when it's tagging at you and tugging at you and making sure that, you know, but, you know, that's the C.S. Lewis quote is that, you know, God whispers to us in our joys and when the things are going good, he whispers, you know, you get those, those, those brief moments mm -hmm. where you can take it all in and feel the presence of God. Mm -hmm. But he shouts to us in our pain. Mm. It's God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world mm. because in the pain we sure listen because mm. nothing else matters in that moment other than the pain. Yeah. Because nothing else, you, can, you can't focus on other things because all you you know, know or feel is the pain. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to, to focus on anybody else, but if you can stop and transcend your poor self and to, to think about others, that that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. He wasn't thinking about, oh, look at poor me. He was thinking about saving the whole entire world. And 
the ramifications about you know everybody mm. individually you know and mm-hmm. it's just that's it's not cliche it's just it's just the truth that's how we can transform our suffering and he's not a god that is absent from our experiences you know it's it's i think i've said this before when when i would teach the hypostatic union it's if God isn't fully God and fully man, then all this is a lie. Love is a lie. The whole the whole thing that Christianity is based on, the whole thing we believe, because God, who's outside of space and time, enters our space and time, enters a fullness of, human, of humanity that when he was on that cross, he experienced, God experienced suffering. It's huge. He didn't have to do that. Freely chosen to experience suffering for us. So if that's not true, if he's undercover God, like if, it's the, if the hypostatic union isn't true, if he's undercover God, then that means it was just a big act, totally fake, and he didn't really go through those things, and he just put on a show for me that he did it for me. And if he's not God fully God, and he just picks some guy to do it for him, well, he picks some guy to suffer for for me? Thanks. Like, true love is the hypostatic union that a fully God and fully man chose to experience that suffering. It's, it's like, when the church teaches these dogmas and when you look at, like, how back in the early Christianity, how much these church fathers fought over these principles, it's like, Okay, whatever. It's just a term, you know. Fully God, fully man. What What does it matter? Just it matters. I have to it, memorize. Yeah. It's just something I have to remember. No, this is literally defining your worth and your purpose as a human being. That if God isn't full, if if Jesus wasn't fully God and fully man, you're really not worth that much. Yeah, and it. I think the the whole thing to realize is that it's not. Only when things are going good is that we're to be thankful for the, for all these these gifts, mm-hmm. for how lucky we are to be saved, and how lucky that you know that what God did for us, this the suffering that He died for, mm-hmm. for all of us, what He gave up. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. That's only not, that isn't just for when everything's okay. Is that we're, it's we're, also we're to, to give be, thanks and it, praise always and everywhere, all things. I'm probably gonna butcher this. I don't know when she did it or. What she? What was it really about? I have I have a, an idea, but I don't want to make make it make it up. But Lady Gaga said something, and then you know she has her foundation in Catholicism. I doubt she's a true practicing Catholic today, but I know she has foundations in Catholicism herself. Where she talks about something really bad that happened to her as a as a young person, and she said she would never take it back because that horrible thing that happened to her allowed for her to be able to be there for so many other people that are have, have gone through the exact same thing and that she wouldn't be able to be there for those people if it had not if that horrible thing that she suffered through didn't happen to her and that's that's the thing that we don't have a distant god we have a god who wants to enter into every aspect of our life and that while while god's permitting evil and suffering in the world, he's also entering into us with, uh, with us. And, and it's, he's, he's allowing the devil not to win in the sense that anything that is suffering, you know, anything that is, all of it, all things can still work towards the good. And he can transform it if we allow him to do that. It's just, we're not used to giving up control. Right. It's just, it's especially when things happen to us or health issues, we don't know how to fix them. We, you know, we got to take this or do that. But mm-hmm. we didn't create us, so we don't know how to, to fix right. a kidney or a... And sometimes these kinds of conversations that we're talking about can become an extreme eye roll to someone who's going through an, a very bad, difficult situation. And it's, there's nothing we're going to be able to do or say but pray for them and try to be empathetic to them. And that when they're on the other side of it is the is the is the real only time when... And even yourself, you know, like me, like I, 
I, I had that pity party. Woe is me. There was nothing anyone could ever say to me that made me snap out of that. I extreme, I rolled every sentence that was like, Ooh, offer it up to God, transformative, you're suffering. I extreme, I rolled it all. This whole podcast, I would have extreme, I rolled being in my situation at the time that I was in, in my headspace, right? But on the other side of that, now I can see when you experience those things, sometimes you're, you're like, I understand why you allowed that, you know, me to experience A, B, and C, right? Because now, on the other side of it, I either am grateful for what I have or who I have in my life, or it's made me more strong, more resilient, able to better uh, experience or better uh, serve others or I'm better at what I do because of what I went through. And there's really, sometimes you only see that part of it when you're on the other side. Yeah, you only, William James was famously said that you only understand your life when you look through it backwards. You have to, mm -hmm. it's so hard to see the, the path, what, what it looks like as you're taking it, you know, but when you zoom back out and look, okay, oh, look, I see where I was at and this twist and this turn and, wow, if I would have went there instead of went here, yeah. things would yeah, you, you know, you look back, but every one of those things were, you know, the reason where you are right now, this second, you know, and it's yep. just like, you don't want to change those things. Right. Father Mike Schmitz um, is in this podcast or the his homily series of uh, based on a true story. Have you been listening to any of those? I don't think I'm Oh, they're, they're good. Um this, the one I was just listening to talked about how he was talking about these movies that were based on a true story. So he was like naming different scenes in these movies that are based on a, on a, on a true story because that's what he's getting into like with you know, the actual story of salvation. He's basing a lot of it off of Rescue Project actually too. Which is funny because that's what our parish is. If you haven't done Rescue Project or listened to it even on the Halo app, do so. It's very good. Father John Ricardo. But anyway, so... He was talking about these movies that inspire us so much. Like one of them was uh, Pursuit of Happiness with uh, Will Smith. Even He even talked about even um, um, Braveheart, even though it has a kind of a sad ending for William Wallace. The actual ending itself was inspirational because it encouraged them to continue to fight. But he said if you pause that movie in these different scenes throughout, and you pause them in their worst moments or you pause them in like even generic moments, wouldn't make the, sto the story the, what it was. It wouldn't be the story that it was. It would end in tragedy or pure suffering or pointlessness. And so when you're in the middle of your stuff you're going through, it's not a pause. You're going through a hard time. We have to acknowledge that we're going to be going through hard times in our life. And so the, in, those, in those valleys... It's easy to look back and say what your purpose was. But when you're in it, it's like you're in that paused movie or you just end the movie without seeing how it ends, right? You're, you're, you're thinking this is a tragedy, right? Does that make sense, what, yeah. what he's saying, well, what, what I'm saying? The, what was the line? Maybe it was Corey Ten Boon that said, well, when you're, if you're on a train and you're going through a dark tunnel and it's getting a really dark time, you don't mm -hmm. just rip your ticket off and jump off. Yeah, you trust the driver's going to get you out of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah. Right. You, put your, you put your trust in God that you're yeah. going to get through there. Right. That when you open up your eyes on the other side, that, hey, it's not mm -hmm. going to be as bad as you thought. Yeah. You know, a lot of our suffering comes from things that never happen. Unfortunately, mm. that, that's how much, like, yeah. You mean in worry? In worry, yeah. I mean, how many things that people worry about and suffer over and yeah. then never happen? It, there are fears of what could happen or should happen or what you think it's going to happen, mm -hmm. doesn't happen. You spend so much time wasted on suffering for it, even though it didn't even happen, hypothetically. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of people do that. It's just, you know, it's, that's, that's, that's why they don't want to try something new or, mm -hmm. you know, get out of their comfort zone because they're worried about, okay, oh, I'm going to fall down or mm -hmm. I'm not going to be good. They're going to make fun of me or yeah. whatever it could be that we don't even want to try to get outside of, of ourselves because of the, the fear of, you know, what other people think or, mm -hmm. you know, but, but real suffering is, is a, is a thing too. I mean, it's just, but people suffer both. Yeah. You know, that's what they say. Would you rather suffer from the, 
the pain of regret or would you suffer from the, the pain and discipline that you put into mm-hmm. to, to, you know, either way? Oh, that's that new trend on social media that you see, like, choose your heart. Did you ever see those? It's ta- it's, when it's talking about working out now, eating right now. Like, that's your heart now. And you're choosing your, if you don't do those things, you're choosing your heart later. Does that make sense? Like, so it's about choose your heart because life's hard. <laughs> like, choose your heart. Period. You're yeah, either yeah, going yeah. to do these certain things, self discipline and motivation, and, and doing what you're supposed to do now, so that later on in life you don't have these these issues that come along with not not doing those things now. And so, well, and and some su- suffering is necessary. You know, mm-hmm. even if if it's not just pain, if it's just you know endurance or you know fasting learning how to go without how to well, how to deny yourself well that's where let's talk about both constructive and destructive forces of nature the existence of the more perfect alongside the less perfect it's it's god's plan plan in god's plan this process of becoming involves those things so it's a, it's it's all like a balance and you have with a physical good there exists a physical evil as long as creation has not reached perfection. So in this natural order, you will have these things that are physical evils versus physical goods. Again, if we look at def- defining evil as that absence of a good, right? So that's an ailment in your body and a physical evil. Like it's, and it's saying it's, it's all in this balance of creation achieving perfection, it's just so much, so much outside of us, you know? And I think and it's all, so we're the small piece of it. And that's where, like, order and chaos come together, is that, that if, if things are in chaos, it's because they're not put in order the right way, that things, mm-hmm. aren't, things aren't, you know, that's what justice is. Justice is things, people get what they, what they deserve or right. what they ought to get. Mm-hmm. But justice in the, in the way that God created the world is that mm-hmm. the things should be in its order the way that he created it right. should be working the, the ways that it was intended to mm-hmm. and when things aren't and they're not doing you know the way that they were meant to be that then something has to to toggle it back mm-hmm. to go back to the way that it's meant to be right because that's that's what uh, saint augustine said peace is tranquility of order that when things are in its right place and doing what they're supposed to be doing, that you can have true peace. I mean, peace isn't just absence of war because peace has to be made. It has to be negotiated. It has to be enforced. It has to have boundaries. You have to have all those things. It isn't just a, like a no, you know. So it just makes sense. It's like it's it's so outside of us and it's so big, but then it's... It, and you really can't simplify it like the catechism says. There is no just simple answer. But if we look at this as we are in these small pieces of this big picture, this really big picture, and if we're looking at this imbalance that happened because of the first sin in the fall, of this imbalance between goodness and beauty and love, which is what God is, not what he's like, it's what he actually is. He's a concentrated ball of love, it's a concentrated pure goodness, concentrated pure beauty. So all these things are what God is. And so when the fall happened, it was this absence, this severing off from that, from that goodness and it allowed a lack of that goodness and a lack of that beauty and a lack of that love to enter into the world. And that's what evil is. And within that, now we have God that who's, who's still in control, but because of our free will and, and the choices that we make, is constantly then trying, or not trying, constantly then upholding a balance, a balance between that, goodness and the absence of it. So like the catechism talks about God is in no way directly or indirectly a cause of a moral evil. He will permit it because he respects the freedom of his creatures and mysteriously knows how to derive good from it. For almighty God, because he is supremely good, would never allow any evil whatsoever to ever exist in his works if he were not so all-powerful and good as to cause a good to emerge from evil itself. In a time 
In time, we can discover that God in his almighty providence can bring a good from, a, from the consequences of an evil. From the consequences of an evil, not from evil itself. From the consequences of an evil. Even a moral evil caused by his creatures. It was not you, said Joseph to his brothers, who God, or who sent me here, but God. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive. From the greatest moral evil ever committed, the rejection and murder of God's only son, caused by all the sins of men, God, by his grace that ab abounded all the more, brought the greatest of goods, the glorification of Christ and our own redemption. But for all that, evil never becomes a good. So it's never saying that the, the things that happen to us are good things that happen to us. It's saying that we need to have a trust that God will take it and use it in some way. I think that's where it's the biggest slap in the devil's face, right? That he could, these, these evil things, you know, you see a big rise of evil right now in our culture. We really shouldn't be worried. We should have hope. I mean, hope that, that he can, because we've seen it. I mean, I've seen him take things that look horrible mm -hmm. and able to, to bring something good out of it. He's, he, makes, he makes things that, like it said right there in, in Genesis with Joseph, his brother sold him into slavery, and he ended up saving his whole family and all of uh, all the people from the Canaan. And it's just, you know, they meant it for evil, but God used that as a way to save his his. There's no way that any of them could have know knew, but he was able to to maneuver it around that way. And that's what we need to trust and to have hope that even in the suffering, even in things that you don't understand, if that's mm -hmm. that promotion that you didn't get or that uh, you know did didn't get the grade that you wanted or the job that you, you know, that you applied for or mm -hmm. the diagnosis that you wanted is that even in those things that to have those conversations with God, you know, a third of the, the Psalms are lamentations. Like, God, why? It's okay to gripe, it, it, but it's, it's okay to do it. That means there's a relationship. A relationship and not doing it to, to, mm -hmm. you know, to be mean about it. But just Let him come dialogue. into it, yeah. bring him in. It's okay to give him to complain. To him, you know, like let it, let him enter in with, with it with you. Yeah. It's not, he doesn't promise, he doesn't promise to take away any of our pains. He promises to be there with us when we, when we're feeling them. Yeah. So this, this area of the catechism ends pretty strong. We firmly believe that God is master of the world and of its history, but the ways of his providence are often unknown to us only at the end. When our partial knowledge ceases, when we see God face to face, will we fully know the ways by which, even through the dramas of evil and sin, God has guided his creation to that definitive Sabbath rest for which he created heaven and earth. So in brief, in the creation of the world and of man, God gave the first and universal witness to his almighty love and his wisdom the plan of a loving goodness which he finds its goal in the new creation in Christ. You know, something to chew on. That's all. Yeah, as we prepare to get ready for, for Advent, we're preparing for this coming. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the different weeks of you know hope and peace and love and joy that we're to think about to prepare for the coming of our Savior, to his condensation mm -hmm. to to you know, humble himself is that sometimes you know the suffering is to humble us. Sometimes suffering is to help us be a bridge to somebody, to have somebody who's going through the same thing you are. Mm -hmm. You know, in the future. And if you're extreme eye rolling this because you're in the middle of a suffering, totally get it. You know, see if there's you know, someone that you could talk to, a person of faith that can walk you through it, that doesn't maybe throw some cliches at you, that just enters into the suffering with you, sits with you. Well, you don't have to be in suffering alone. 
sometimes just sitting next to someone who's suffering. There's really nothing I could say to you when you're going, and every time, you you know. Well, that's the whole moral of the story with Job. His friends did the right thing for seven days. When they just sat with him. They just sat with him for seven days. There's as nothing... soon as they start opening their mouth, it's blaming them. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, not helping. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have someone in your life, you don't know how to help them in their suffering, you don't have to. You're not Jesus. You're not their Messiah. But you you can go to them be and them. be with them, spend time with them if they want you to. Sometimes people don't want that. You know, you just really got to pray, pray with them, pray for them, and offer your your you're just yourself to be there with them in that in that moment and let them extreme eye roll your advice. It's okay. A lot of people in pain do that. And it you know anything else you want to add on this, Mr. Sufferer? No, I think that's about it. That's good. <laughs> you know, I think in the end we just need to trust that God knows what he's doing. And we and it's okay to be mad at him. And it's okay to be to to have questions. But at the end of the day we're we're asked to trust. Yep. So. All right, let's end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, okay. Son, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Lord, we trust you. We trust you in all your wisdom, all your truth, goodness, and beauty. We ask you, Lord, to be with us, especially those who may be listening, who are suffering, or care for someone who is suffering. Help us to be witnesses, to, to do that well, to unite any of the, our sufferings with the cross of your Son. Help us to alleviate the suffering of others. As you broke for us, help us to break for others. And if we are in pain, help us to unite that pain, to alleviate some of the pain in this world. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God bless you. Have a good day.